Welcome back to DBC. Today we're continuing with games criminals play and we're moving on to the next chapter which is called the setup which is really the meat and potatoes, the biggest chunk of like the actual content of the book as far as like step-by-step -step process of how do criminals set up the employees and the correctional people that they work with to get them to break the law. And so the first thing about the setup is that it's understood either partially or entirely that the steps were going to cover by all the inmates, even though not all inmates are engaged in the practice and most inmates aren't engaged in all of the steps. There are three techniques that we're going to cover, three techniques, eight tools that they use, and then three turnouts is the term at the end. Let's hop right in. The three techniques of a setup. Number one is the observation step. And the idea here is that manipulation cannot take place without a victim and that the victims are selected on purpose for specific reasons, reasons which are first established in this observation step. And interesting things, there's so much going on in this process. So employee responses to seemingly harmless questions. So just like how they're doing, just what kind of engagement is the employee giving? Uh, which employees are distracted easily? What is each employee's tolerance level for infractions, especially small infractions, because there's like sort of a way to, to get in. Body language, so pacifying gestures, which are things like this movement or this, or wringing of the hands, uh, biting fingernails, all these things display unease or nervousness. And they usually operate at an unconscious level from the person and from the observer, but prisoners and criminals, to use their term, are consciously aware of what's going on from a, like a micro gesture level. So also the opposite. So steepling, which is doing this with the fingers leaning back in a chair, gravity defying gestures, which is anything that is gravity defying. So putting your hands on your head like this, these all show ease and comfort, which criminals would tend to shy away from when they're looking for a victim. Uh, other nonverbal things, such as non-press clothing or partial uniforms or buttons left undone, they all indicate sloppiness and can be interpreted as inattention to detail, which obviously translates to details uh, from infractions that are to come. So the idea here is that employees should be aware of their own nonverbal communication of what are they saying even before they open their mouths. Speaking of open the mouths, the next thing is listen, uh, other types of observation are listening, verbal, and actions. So listening observation is the fact here is that Employee conversations are always monitored by inmates, even if they're barely within earshot and they're not even engaged with the person. The idea, what they're looking for here is how does an employee respond to their superiors, interact with their, uh, their peers, and interact with the, with the inmates. The question is, do you display professionalism with all of these groups or only certain of them or not at all? Uh, inmates are always listening to what is what, in, what the employees are telling them and even if they aren't speaking with them, obviously. Uh, the, and then this information they gather from this is mirrored back to the employees and used to establish rapport to potentially manipulate that person later. Another type of observation is verbal observation. And this is sort of a preliminary testing of a potential victim. So a turner will approach an employee with peers or inmates to see if that employee accepts them as more than just normal inmates. Uh, the team also notes the employee's reactions to negative verbal interactions going on. The Turner, what they're looking for are, is as small as even just facial expression and reactions of the employee to see where they're at with, with respect to rapport and everything. So the inmate will ask the employee for a favor and the response will tell them a great deal about what they need to know moving forward. And the takeaway here is that employees should always be aware of the message that the inmate is really getting from a conversation, let's say. So there's always the words that are issued in a conversation, but what is the subtext of the conversation as far as the dynamics of the relationship and everything going on? Action observation is the last form of observation. And this is here an inmate, uh, they'll voice a suggestion of their intent to violate a rule to test uh, where the vict potential victim stands. For example, uh, they, they, it's usually gonna be a minor rule and they wanna see what the employee's response is. So for example, like, oh, I know I'm not allowed to be up in your, in your tier or your level, but I need, uh, I need to ask a friend tomorrow. So you might notice that I'm up there. And then the next day, the inmate will be up there and the officer ignores them. They know 
we're on our way. So part two is the selection of a victim. So we're, at this point, we're just observing and maybe some little testing. Two types of selection practices, so intentional and accidental. Intentional is an employee who appears extroverted, friendly, naive. Weakness is presupposed in this person. There can also be accidental selection, which is when an otherwise strong employee and someone with good judgment is, let's say, reassigned to an, un to an unfamiliar position, so they don't know kind of what's going on in the, in the details. Speaking of the employees, there are three types from the perspective of the inmates or the criminals with respect to manipulation. They're soft, hard, and mellow. So soft is usually a very trusting, overly familiar person who's also naive. They are usually understanding and sympathetic to the inmates' problems and issues. And combined with an inability to say no, this is just begging to be exploited from someone who's looking to do that. A hard employee is a strict, uh, by the rule book person, and they grant inmates no leeway. And a mellow employee is sort of in between, which they know when to be soft and when to be hard, and how to use these traits at appropriate times. And surprisingly, inmates of these three, they focus actually on the soft and the hard person to exploit um, because of the hesitancy to say no in the soft employee and the perceived weakness that is being masked by the hard employee's strictness and lack of leeway. So they perceive that as actually as masking weakness. Next step is testing of limits and what they call fish testing, which are ways to test what was guessed at in observation so far. So testing limits is the process of uh, pushing and bending or breaking minor rules usually to determine how far the manipulator can go before the employee will actually take action and stop and step in. Fish testing occurs when members of a setup team request minor items that an employee is not supposed to issue. So small, they will. It's always step by step here. The testing phase here is done slowly. So if an employee allows a great deal of license and a bunch of stuff, the testing process will be sort of slowed down and interspersed with support pledges to ward off suspicion of what's going actually going on. So they won't get too greedy. They'll take their time. Next up are the tools in the setup. This is a really interesting part. So the tools. Number one is the support system, which are a series of verbal praises designed to befriend and develop a sense of togetherness and understanding to sum up the inmate support system. That's what that is. In this, the employee is made to feel that they are something special, that their peers don't understand them, and that where he could not trust the people he works for or works with, he can count on the inmates. There's sort of a division. So the employee will be meant to feel like they're actually more of an in-group with the inmates than with their own peers. Empathy or sympathy are also have a, a key role here. Empathy is about shared understanding, experience and vicarious uh, experience of feelings, thoughts, and attitudes. So this forms a bond, and the more areas that are encompassed by empathy between two people, any two people in this case, uh, an employee and an inmate, the greater the bond between them grows. Sympathy, however, on the other hand, this demonstrates a feeling without necessarily having had the experience uh, that induced that emotion. So during the observation phase, the inmate grapevine, like so how they speak to each other, can be used to exploit information gained to build sympathy or empathy in this phase. So having twins as an employee, for example, or liking fly fishing or any, any sort of hobby or something about the person. There will also be a plea for help. Inmates here bank on the employee's need for ego fulfillment and closure. Employees want to see the results of their work a lot of times in corrective, corrective facilities. They might work with someone for years and maybe switch jobs and the, employee, the inmate gets transferred. They don't really see a concrete finished product and there's a desire to have that. Unlike a carpenter who can see like when a chair is complete, for example. They rarely see successful completion of their work with the plea for help to determine if it's a legitimate request, the employee should, as a test back, discuss the problem with somebody else and make sure that the inmate knows that the employee is aware of the request. If it's a legitimate request, the prisoner will welcome help from a counselor or someone else. And if this is a setup, they'll let the victim know that the situation has been resolved once they find out it's been shared. Next step, kind of tying back to the, the plea uh, or the splitting of the staff, what we would call, is the we-they syndrome. So unfortunate information, the employee was too drunk at a party, let's say, for example, is used to separate the victim from other staff. So the victim will turn to inmates for ego support, 
dividing and conquering the staff here. So offering a protection which is woven in with the support system tactics and the we they think you need. So the inmate will appeal to the employee's desire to improve their work, like to get a better typewriter, for example, or something like that. Also, wrapping up the last couple, there are allusions to sex. So female staff are targets of male inmates. However, it's got to be carefully planned. The prisoner creates this, an, Im an image of themselves that directly opposes someone trying to get laid at first, for example. So after trust is developed, then it's a proposition, an insistence, and eventually even force. Sex is first alluded to with the guard and someone else, another inmate, not the person that's actually talking to them. And then if it's okay to proceed, this is okay, we can sort of slowly insert ourselves into that and face somebody else. The touch system. So touch begins innocently and accidentally and escalates. It's progressive in nature. And then, of course, there is the rumor clinic. So rumors are used to isolate employees from their peers. And then the prisoners can come in and strengthen the bond by expressing empathy. Again, so these are all kind of tying into one another. And the last phase of the setup are called turnouts. So a jailhouse turnout can be one of two things. An inmate who is selected by his peers to function as a male prostitute and then forced against his will. Or it's also a term for an employee who's been successfully coerced in supplying prisoners with contraband or favors. The turnout is the point of no return in the setup. So we're not really just observing or kind of testing or being manipulation. This is where the provocateurs, they make their wants explicitly known here. And success at this step is actually breaking the law, whereas before it wasn't. Step 12 is the shopping list. So this is an, an, uh, an urgent, though polite request for prohibited goods based on what seems to be a valid. It's always going to seem to be a valid need. It's not just like, hey, I want a bunch of drugs. No. And this, the sales pitch here is interspersed with reasons for this need, justifications for this act. These are all calculated to assuage the victim's mind and what's, what's going on in their head. For males, the shopping list usually consists of drugs, alcohol, money, weapons, and sometimes homosexual acts. For females, it's almost always a request for sex first, as we just spoke, of, spoke about, and then drugs, alcohol, or money. And of course, with any sort of request, we have to have a lever for it to work with a power differential. And this is used if the employee refuses the initial request for a shopping list. They are sternly reminded of their earlier indiscretions which were the small infractions that they let slide. And the inmates will threaten exposure if they don't comply with the shopping list. To make this more effective, inmates will state that this will only be a request or a demand so that the employee believes that the pressure will be lifted permanently when the request is fulfilled. It'll only, be, it'll only be done once. Oh, just one time thing. Excellent. The sting is the last step, and this is where it gets really dangerous. Most inmates involved in a setup would rather not resort to the use of force. They kind of want to get what they want to get and keep the, the, the wheels spinning. But as a last resort, you can rest assured that they will if they need to. When a setup reaches this last stage, most employees comply with the demand. Many will actually resign. Some take the risk of being injured or embarrassed when the lever is introduced, so that sort of leverage, uh, and they expose the involved in they don't want to do that. And the consequences here for saying no can be obviously hostility up all the way until death. And that is the biggest chapter in the book, the, the meat and potatoes long video of the setup portion. And all these steps go all the way through. And sometimes I'll jump back and forth. And that's all we got for today. We'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching.